Hello everybody, it's George from Ireland. Um, so here I am with uh, In My Own Time by um, uh, Jeremy Thor. God, I should have held this up at the beginning, get it into the thumbnails. Um, so his autobiography, and there is the man himself. Uh, and um, I'm reviewing it only 24 years after it came out. So uh, that's it. The blurb, the dust jacket blurb, here it is. One of the most characteristic, characteristic politicians of the age Jeremy Thorpe recalls important events and episodes in his life and fascinating collection of anecdotes and reminiscences. Well, I, I shan't read it all, but it's got forwards from various people like Sir Clement Floyd, the late Clement Floyd, grandfather of, of Sigmund, uh, the one who was out grandfather by, by, by Churchill's grandson um, in China. Clement Floyd himself, former Liberal MP, uh, possibly disgraced by allegations of a sexual abuse of a prepubescent girl. Lord Averbury, another Liberal and so on. Not everybody, Sir, Sir, Sir Cyril Smith, the late Lord Briggs. I went to a talk by him. Um, so uh, mostly liberals. But anyway, there is the man himself. But unusually for an autobiography, it's got it's got a thematic rather than a chronological approach. Now, um, uh, which is um, fascinating and um, enthralling, and it doesn't dwell on anything for too long. It's got pace because it can be too involved, too too, too self justificatory. It's not an apologia, but um, the one there's a certain loss of coherence for the fact that it doesn't have this linear narrative. It's a shoot the chronological approach, which is customary um but uh, you know he was always very much his own man jeremy thorpe um but it's a small price to pay this loss of coherence for making it um so much more um readable to hjl now, i don't know who hjl is in memoriam that's the dedication his first life was caroline Allpass. i thought it might have been dedicated to to her but no she died in a in a car crash relatively young in 1970, about, about about 35, right after the June 1970 election, the Rupert had a son, Rupert. One of the salient facts about um, Jeremy Thorpe is that he was a homosexualist and a practicing one at that. Um, he'd got into that as a schoolboy at Eton. Now, one of the boys dabbled in that, but grew out of it as soon as they left school, but not him. He was primarily homosexual. But when he became leader of the Liberal Party, it was decided that he must take unto himself a wife. So he cast around for a good wife. There was Caroline Allpass had already passed the age of 30. It's a very unusual name. I mean, he met one other person with the surname Allpass, but she didn't spell it quite the same. They, 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 in in, in Thorpe's um, biography by the redoubtable Michael Block, he said that Caroline Allpass was a queer's mole, a bit like we say a fag hag these days. A very tall lady, but actually um, strikingly good looking. But he married her. She was in a virgin on a wedding day, it's thought, which was, which was common for the time. And he apparently had done it with a woman beforehand. But, you know, this is prior to 1967 and, and her homosexual acts were still a crime in between of all ages. Um, but and then it was decriminalized only for those over 21, only two of them at the time, no, no threesomes. And in private, they couldn't be watched by people and so on. But nevertheless, he he um, tried to be um, heterosexual, at least or at least bi, and succeeded and actually quite liked it. Although from the time I met Caroline Allpass, so far as I'm aware, he never had intimate relations with a male, but he certainly had done his youth, which is to prepare, to, which is to be his undoing. Remember, when he was elected to Parliament in 1959, um, at the age of 30, for Devon North, it was still very much a crime. So it's got photos and uh, reminiscences, recollections of his grandparents, Jack Norton Griffiths, whom we never met, Sir, 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 Sir John Norton Griffiths, Empire Jack, as he was known, um, who was briefly a Conservative and Unionist MP, who was an engineer who made a fortune around the world in Ployesh, Romania, blowing up oil wells in the First World War to prevent them falling into German hands in, 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 in um, 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 Angola as well but eventually uh, had a disastrous project in the 1920s, was it? Um, construction project and committed suicide because of that. There was a bit of suicide as well in his, the family, apart from that, Thorpe's sister committed suicide. There's his father, who was briefly a Conservative MP as well, J.H. Thorpe, King's Council, who decided to um, uh, give up Parliament to practice at the bar, but um, died um, in 1944 when Jeremy Thorpe was just 15, because of course there are the parents on the wedding day, um, so um, it's not that eloquent, this book. I mean, it's um, engaging. It's, it's reasonably fast moving. Uh, it could be read aloud. It's almost oral li literature. So um, it sparkles on the page, but in a way it's unimpressive you for someone of such articulacy. But I suppose it's better known for oracy than writing. There's his redoubtable mother with her trademark um, 
uh, monocle. She only wore glasses in the sea and he had one bad eye. Almost unique for a woman to wear a monocle, just like Thorpe wore his hat, his, um, what sort of hat was it? a Homburg hat? But he said that's because his uncle by marriage generously undertook to pay his school fees to provide him with a financial subvention at university. And of course, when he was reading from the bar, remember in those days, you didn't get a penny when you, you, were, you were a pupil at the bar. And um, in return, his uncle had some sort of hat factory, he said, wear a hat to advertise him. So he did, and he was a, a, a walking advertisement for the declining millinery industry for the rest of his life. And it thought, mentioned one of his grandfathers who came from Cork, who was a Church of Ireland clergyman, who Thorpe seems to be a bigot. And it was later speculated by Bob Block, this possibly it was explicative of Thorpe's um, lack of sympathy for Ulster Unionism, which he associated with um, uh, Protestantism. Of course, Thorpe was a nominal member of the Church of England, and he loved kowtowing to the establishment. That's why he got married in the, um, uh, the, the um, Archbishop of Canterbury's private chapel at Lambeth Palace and so on had the Archbishop present. There's a cartoon about him marrying Caroline Allpass as a Conservative, and Edward Heath, the Conservative leader, is supposedly playing the organ. Grosser Heath could indeed um, play the organ. He used to like to conduct orchestras. So there he is, marital bris with Caroline. You can see she's a handsome female. And there he is, um, fishing off some pier. So his name was most extraordinary ebullience, Michael Ramsey, sometime Archbishop of Canterbury, whom he befriended, who attended his wedding reception and so on. Of course, then he married um, Marion, the Countess of Harewood. She was married to the Queen's cousin. She'd been a teenage Jewish Viennese refugee in the 1930s. Um, yeah. And uh, there are some of his musical acquaintances um, in Red Square, Moscow, because um, his second wife, Marion, she's a good friend of the composer Benjamin Britten. And Benjamin Britten lived in a long term gay relationship with Peter Pears. But um, uh, Marion Thorpe didn't want to hear about homosexuality. That's how closeted things were, because when Thorpe happened to raise a topic in a general way, far from fessing up, they'd been actively gay for years. She uh, made it plain she never wanted to hear about this topic ever again. But she wasn't completely naive. Surely she was aware that her friend uh, Benjamin Britten and Peter Pears were more than just good friends who'd lived together for decades. OK, and then um, Yehudi Menuhin, the famed violinist, was a friend of theirs because she was very musical, Marion Countess of Harewood. She had three three sons with a husband. Then she, they got divorced because of his infidelity. So he was a gifted pianist, Jeremy thought He'd even considered um, becoming a professional violinist, not pianist violinist. He was into collecting Chinese um, objets d'art, chinoiserie, one should say. Talked about when he was a schoolboy Eaton, cycling over to Dorneywood to visit a peer of the realm. Um, with his friend Simon Barrington Ward, who was later um, Bishop of Coventry, um, because Dorney Ward is just about four miles north of Eton, just north of Slough, quite close to the Thames, because of course there's Dorney Reach, and Dorney Wood was subsequently gifted by Lord Courtauld Thompson to the to um, the nation, and that's the country residence of the Chance Exchequer. Is the Courtauld Inst Institute named in his honour? I don't know. So it's called to the bar. He practiced desultorily at the criminal bar and so on. Then he uh, supplemented his meagre income by interviewing for independent television, ITV, which had just been launched. It was highly contentious whether they would just produce gutter television for the sake of um, advertising revenue. He went all around the world to interview King Hussein of Jordan and then saw him pardon two men who tried to assassinate him or something, um, interviewing the Shah of Iran, they in Iran and things like that. It was all over Africa. So um, um, Thorpe, he recalls how well he knew the former prime minister, David Lloyd George, who we called his tide as in the Welsh word for grandfather, um, because he, remember, Thorpe only knew one of his grandfathers. The others had died before Jeremy Thorpe was born. And there is Jeremy Thorpe's father and someone else is Willem Lloyd George, David Lloyd George's sons, supposedly dressed up as the emperor and empress of Ethiopia. Willem Lloyd George, later a national liberal MP, effectively conservative, home secretary, the one who ordered the last woman in Britain to be hanged to actually go to the gallows, Ruth Ellis, and was spoken about as a possible future prime minister. But that didn't happen. Now, this is considered to be all very non-PC these days, sort of blackface. But Abyssinia, we now call it Ethiopia, at the time of the Italian invasion. And they're becoming anti-appeasement, but not wanting to spend much on, on war. And obviously wanted to team up with another genocidal totalitarian regime, which by 1936 had murdered far, far more people than the Third Reich had, the Soviet Union. OK, um, so uh, that was it. And so then when a memorial to David Lloyd George was unveiled in, 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 the, in Parliament, they had um, uh, Jeremy Thorpe deliver the tribute to him, John Jeremy Thorpe, to give him his proper name, but he went by his middle name, Jeremy.
So he had cordial relations with 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 um, the Prime Minister Harold Wilson, a Labour man who'd been a former member of the Liberals himself as an undergraduate, but very testy relationship with a rather um, bland, um, uh, inhuman Edward Heath, who was square faced and square in every other sense as well. Um, and then here's Thorpe's tribute to two women um, as a crashing snob. Both the daughters of former prime ministers, Violet Bonham Carter, the daughter of Henry Herbert Asquith, and then Megan Lloyd George, the daughter of David Lloyd George. She then became a Labour MP, having briefly been a Liberal MP, realising there was no future really there. So he used to go on his summer holidays and stay with the Lloyd Georges in Wales through his childhood. He was evacuated to the United States in 1940. Jeremy Thorpe, he stayed with his aunt by marriage there in, um, in Connecticut, went to school there for three years, um, took summer holidays on a lake in, in New Hampshire, it was, it was Winnipesaukee. He very much supported Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Repub uh, sorry, Democratic Party and against Wendell Wilkie's uh, Republicans. So, um, yeah, um, so he knew Isaac Foote as well with the distinguished Foote family. Sir Dingle Foote was a Liberal MP for somewhere in, in Cornwall, I think, Viscount Samuel. Lord Beveridge, who was himself briefly a Liberal MP, Master of University College, Oxford, my old college, knew Nye Bevan, the first health secretary, the time of the National Health Service being founded, who was a very formidable uh, Labour MP on the far left, part of the Keep Left group, said that he considered the Tories lower than vermin. Herbert Morrison, the sometime Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Labour man, grandfather of Peter Mandelson, but don't hold that against Herbert Morrison. Um, so, yeah, he got along well with Wilson. And, and there are pen portraits of Pierre Trudeau, the um, Prime Minister of Canada, Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel. And all this very oppressive, considering the Liberal Party, you know, was hovering in somewhere between existence and non-existence. Each election was a, was a near-death experience for the Liberal Party under him. Remember, they only had they only had six MPs at one stage. They could all fit in a mini or, or, or meet, meet, in a, meet in a phone box. But then they had Cyril Smith, who was grossly obese, the MP for Rochdale, who probably needed his own mini to fit in. Um, and so on. He explains his conversion to the Liberal causes, how he cut a seat at the Oxford Union. Uh, he was present at the Oxford Union, very distinguished, probably all of them dead now there in that photo. Um, Robin Day, who was a, in the Liberal Party but later became a BBC interviewer, he was a barrister too, and so on. And the famous 1975 debate before the vote, the referendum on staying in the European Economic Community, where um, he um, put the case alongside Edward Heath, the Conservative um, leader, former, former Prime Minister, against Barbara Castle and Peter Shaw, both Labour MPs. And he brought it down and much about his North Devon constituency and so on, how his um, mother and grandmother, stalwart conservatives, came over to the liberal side to support him. They certainly believed in him. And he um, uh, denies ever having had a um, sexual relationship with Norman Joseph, who later went by the name Norman Scott. And the, the, the alleged um, uh, conspiracy to murder Norman Joseph, he does briefly talk about his trial and maintains his innocence throughout. No surprise there then. Um, so... Yeah. And was he going to go into government? He could have been foreign secretary, prop up the Conservatives after the indecisive February 1974 result. So, um, yeah, it, it is scintillating. And I would uh, greatly recommend this to you. So it's a, an unconventional autobiography. He quotes his own speech to a bit. He doesn't bore us with data too much. He does have a bit of data. He doesn't really reflect on his um, poor decision making. But by 1979, he's voted out of, 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 of um, Parliament and he wasn't going to come back. Um, but yeah, he was lively. As he said, he enjoyed politics like his grandfather's before him. That's true. And like um, Union Jack, his grandfather or Empire Jack, rather, um, uh, he believed in causes well outside the United Kingdom. He believed in um, racial equality in the Commonwealth, um, Thorpe, um, whereas um, his, his grandfather wanted to maintain the empire as it was beforehand. So he was very much for the cause of Zimbabwe, Jeremy Thorpe. Uh, as in ending minority rule in what was then known as Rhodesia. But he managed to get world leaders to meet him when really he was a nobody. He didn't get a sniff of power, but he did get the Liberals to have over 20 percent of the vote in 1974, their best result for for, for almost 50 years. Um, yeah, so that's him. He had friends all around the world. Um, so Jeremy Thorpe, but then he was briefly um, uh, Secretary General, whatever it was, of, of Amnesty International with the United Kingdom of the early 80s. But there, about a month, there was sackfuls of wrathful mail. So he had to resign from that position. And he was just retired. And then he was stricken by Parkinson's. He was someone who should have taken to the stage. There was always an actor in him, really. Um, he was an ardent Europhile right from the get-go, arguing that the United Kingdom ought to accede 
to the European Economic Community, or the common market, as it's usually known back then. And he was there at the signing of the Treaty of Rome. He wasn't a signer himself. He's part of this Keep Britain in Europe. Maggie Thatcher was in it too. Many Conservatives were in it too. Um, okay, so that's all about this. And uh, it's fascinating. I got it yesterday and I've read almost the whole book already. So, and then he spent most of his time in North Devon at a lovely house in London as well. Got through his wife's um, uh, divorce, his second wife. Look, a memorial to his first wife, Caroline, all passed. I would like to go and see it. I was actually brought, I was in China when he died. And he had this memorial service, a funeral at St. Margaret's Church, Westminster. I would like to go and see his grave down somewhere in southwest England, probably his Devon North constituency. There he is with his son, Rupert, a famed photographer who took those photos in Hello magazine, published in 2002, of the wedding of, um, what, who are they? Um, that one from the Darling Buns of May, Catherine Zeta-Joan, the Welsh actress. And who's that old American actor? I forgot his name. Um, so here he is um, with his son at Chuggerton, their house in the North Devon constituency. He was cruelly stricken by Parkinson's and deprived of his um, uh, ability to do faces. Apparently he's a very gift, gifted person when it came to mimicry and so on. Right. Thank you so much um, for watching. Please make sure you um, subscribe on Patreon, donate on PayPal. Bye.